Hi everyone, it is Kiara of the Irvine Home, um, better known as Ivana's mom. Um, I'm doing, I'm finally doing a video and answering all your frequently asked questions because I get a lot of them. Um, I get a lot of the same questions asked over and over again. Um, I actually got quite a few questions, a uh, total between my Instagram um, page and my our Facebook page, I got a total of about 38 questions. Um, so because of that and because I want to do some good explanations, um, I'm actually going to split this video into two parts um, just because I don't want these videos, videos to be too long and I don't want anyone to get bored. So I thought I would split the videos into two release them kind of on two different days just so you guys all stay engaged um, so let's get with that so some of the first questions I got is um, I've gone back into your post to find exactly why this journey began for your family but haven't been able to find a full explanation this is on Instagram so I can see why I got this question as our Facebook page kind of has our history and what it and then I got another question is what does Ivana have um, and then another question of, I've always been curious what she's sick from, how did she get it, and so, and prior to delivery, did you and your husband know of her medical condition? So basically, you guys want a history. Okay, so a little summary of our little journey is my husband and I decided to start a little family. We got married, bought a house, my husband finished up his schooling, so it was time to have a baby. So we got pregnant, and then was at the 20 week ultra, 20 week detailed ultrasound. Um, we went in for the ultrasound. It's it's usually that test where you go in to find you have if find out if you're having a boy or a girl. Um, but let me tell you that it's a lot more than just finding out the gender of your child. And it was during that ultrasound that they detected a heart defect. Um, kind of the, one of the first diagnoses we were given was just pulmonary atresia. Um, further along in my pregnancy, um, we they were querying whether she had MAFCAs or not. So that's about that's kind of how it started. So during my pregnancy, we had lots of ultrasounds. It was around 37 weeks that I relocated up to Edmonton to deliver. Um, I was finally induced at 39 weeks. After when I got to six centimeters, I ended up having an emergency C-section because Ivana kept deselling. Ivana was born. She was quickly transferred from the hospital that I delivered at over to the Children's Stollery Hospital into the NICU, the surgical NICU there. It was there that they did that um, they confirmed her type of heart defect. And, it, and I'll get into her heart defect a little bit later, but then, but because of her type of heart defect, even though it was the more severe one that we, of the two heart defects that they were kind of back and forth when I was pregnant, she got the more severe one, but it's one that they couldn't do surgery on right away. So they're like, oh, okay, your child has this heart defect, but there's nothing we can do right now. So go back to Calgary. So at three days old, she was transferred back to Calgary. We spent about a week in the NICU here in Calgary and we went home at nine days old um, when Ivana was nine days old and she did amazing. She was, you know, feeding and eating well and, you know, every time we went to a cardiac appointment or a genetics appointment, they just couldn't, couldn't believe how well she was thriving at home. She was eating and growing and developing and, and then when she... It was during this time that we confirmed that she did indeed have um, 22 deletion 11 or DiGeorge syndrome. I often refer to it as 22Q. So it was around two months old that we got the genetic test back that stated that she did have 22Q. Um, and this is definitely what caused her heart defect. Uh, we had a, in last summer she had a cardiac cath to kind of determine a surgery date and then so at five months old we went up to Edmonton for our very first open heart surgery. Um, the surgery she had it's called a unifocalization. Prior to surgery our cardiologist stated that she, you know it was a bigger surgery and you know they we got the timeline of four to six weeks in hospital but she told us, she's like, well, with Ivana, you know, because of how well she's doing, I wouldn't be surprised if you guys were at home in three or four weeks. And so let's just say that our cardiologist feels really bad because, but at the same time, no one could have, no one could have guessed or predicted our, our, our complications, the complications that we do, that we did have. So 
Um, so it was October 6, 2014 that Ivana went in for her open heart surgery and the surgery went great. Um, the surgeon was able to do the unifocalization and insert the conduit. Um, he however wasn't able to close her VSD at the time. The VSD is a hole in her heart so Ivana still technically has a hole in her heart. So she that's the reason why she sat slower. Uh, it, however it was it was um, when it came time to extubate Ivana, so for surgery Ivana was intubated and hooked up to a ventilator and when it came time to extubate her, we couldn't. Like every time we tried she would have troubles breathing and her CO2 would rise and she couldn't breathe on her own so we would have to, for her own safety, had to re-intubate her and that's kind of why, that's kind of the background story to all of this and there are so many other little events um, that have, you know, or curveballs that have been thrown our way between all this, you know, so the trouble's extubating, and then in, at the end of October she did cold, she actually had a cardiac arrest at the end of October. In February we had, she had a mechanical valve at one point and that kept clotting, it caught, actually clotted in an almost closed position the first time and we almost lost her then. She's had a few acute liver failure things, um, her septic shock episode, um, we just have had so many huge curveballs that have just prolonged our hospital stay, so many other additional surgeries, and just it's just been one thing after another, and it's just been a very long journey. So that's kind of the summary. I got quite a few questions about her heart, and how many surgeries she's had, and kind of also I got a few questions about a transplant, so I guess I'll answer those as well. Um, today, Ivana has had seven surgeries. She's had three open heart surgeries. The first surgery was the unifocalization I was talking about. The second surgery, open heart surgery she had was to place a mechanical valve. And the third open heart surgery was to take out that darn mechanical valve that kept clotting and she and put in a bovine, so a cow valve. That's why we call her little boo moo. Um, so those are the three open heart surgeries. She then had two right diaphragm right diaphragm placations and that was basically um, her diaphragm became paralyzed it's something that's quite common with open heart surgery kids might have uh, one of their di one of their diaphragms become paralyzed or not move properly so dr. Rebecca our cardiac surgeon went in and pinned it down so those are so and she had that happen we we did it twice to her and then she had a major left thoracotomy last December and that was almost longer than her original open heart surgery. I swear it was an eight hour surgery. Um, the point of that surgery was to resection the left subclavian off the back of her trachea to try and help her trachea out. But we also, Dr. Rebecca tried and did, um, she, for her heart anatomy she's got collaterals and he went and did a plexi so he went to try and like make one of the collaterals bigger. And then her seventh surgery was her trachostomy and that was done in March. So those are seven surgeries and I got the question is if she'll have future surgeries. As Ivana grows, so Ivana has a conduit and a valve in her and just it's those won't grow with her so as she grows um, over time our cardiac surgeon will have to go in and put in bigger put in a bigger conduit or a valve to fit Ivana. So Yes, she will have future surgeries. We don't know when those will be. It kind of just depends on Ivana and how long that we can get away with the valves that she has. Um, it, more in the immediate future, she will have what's called cardiac casts. Um, those we will be having lots of. We'll probably have one every, right now, it's my understanding that we're going to have one every six months. Um, we are actually planning one either at the end of this year, beginning of next year, and um, and I believe there'll be I believe those won't just be diagnostic casts. I believe there'll be procedural casts. So they'll be going in, and the person, the doctor performing it, will be trying trying to balloon some of her collaterals. So they're not surgeries per se, but they're pretty darn risky still. So they're that's kind of what our immediate future looks like with Ivana. I always get a few questions, um, is there a cure, does she have pulmonary vein stenosis or hypoplastic left heart syndrome? So the full diagnosis or the full for her heart, what she was born with is she was born with Tetralogy of Follow with pulmonary atresia and ASD, VSD and MACAs. Um, Tetralogy of Follow is, um, it's kind of a, 
in the heart world, it's a harsh, it's a kind of a common heart defect, um, but it's kind of the least of Ivana's worries. Um, the bigger issue is the mapkas. You'll always hear me talk about her mapkas or her collaterals, and this is what makes Ivana really, really unique. So to kind of explain, and the reason I'm going to explain about her collaterals is to so I can answer the question about a transplant later on. So. MAPCA stand for Major Aorta Pulmonary Collateral Arteries. So when Ivana was born, she wasn't born with a pulmonary artery and she also wasn't um, in utero, didn't develop a ductus. Um, a ductus is what, um, it's that hole in the heart that all babies are born with that close when they're born. And it's kind of what helps the blood bypass, I believe, the lungs while the baby's in utero. So Ivana wasn't born with that, so her heart made these collaterals. A collateral, um, it's something that, so say you had a heart attack and it's, your body would make a collateral to help itself out. Um, but as soon as the body recovered, that collateral would fall away. So it's these like little vessels, or this is the best way I can describe it. Ivana's got five of them. She's got two collaterals that go from her heart to her left lung and she's got three collaterals that go from her heart to her right lung. As of right now, from what, um, from her last cath, her three right collaterals are okay and they're partially behaving. Her left ones are a cause of concern. Um, during her last cath, they couldn't even get a wire through her collaterals, so that's definitely a huge concern right now. Um, collateral MAPCAs are so random. They're random. Every I'm friends with quite a few MAPCA families around the world, and but each one of our kids is so different. Um, they, there's no DNA for collaterals to grow. They're not meant to be there, um, but that's all Ivana has. And they have, they just have a lot of problems and they can um, narrow or stenose quite often. And this is the reason why, so I get all the question, oh, why not just give her a transplant? We can't. And the reason why is Ivana would need um, both a heart and a lung transplant. So that's a double organ transplant. And at just at this age, she wouldn't survive one. She would not survive a double organ transplant. And, um, you know, it, it's not Ivana's heart that's bad. Like, she's got some decreased function. Um, so she's got some decreased right ventricle function. But overall, her heart's kind of okay. It's the collaterals that are Ivana's major issue. And we can't, like they just can't go and replace those, that unique pathway to her lungs. And so that's why Ivana can't have a transplant. And just, it's why we often get told that we may get to a point that she's considered terminal. Um, we're not at that point right now, but it's a huge, reality for Nick and I that one day we could lose her um, and that is why we can't do a transplant so maybe one day she could um, the youngest here in Alberta of a girl they did a heart and lung transplant on a girl a five-year-old girl years ago that was successful um, but I believe her she had a more of a lung issue um, but again um, and at the same time, I think a lot of people are under the impression that a transplant is a cure, and that's a huge misconception. A transplant has its own, it's a, a transplant is a disease in itself. You're always worrying about rejection and other things. So you're just setting, one cardiologist said technically we would be trading a big set of problems for a small set of problems, but it's still problems. So a transplant isn't, you know, a fix or a cure either so that's hopefully answers all the questions about Ivana's heart why I call it Ivana's special heart and answers questions about transplants and kind of Ivana's care moving forward and why she's had the surgery she's had now and why she's why she will continue to need surgeries and procedures done moving forward so I got quite a few questions about Ivana's 22Q syndrome. Um, are all of Ivana's medical struggles related to 22Q? Uh, how does her 22Q affect other conditions? And then a little bit about her immune system. I get why. It was probably another 22Q mom that asked that question. 
and even about the heart transplant. So first about the heart transplant, from my understanding, her Dijor syndrome does not make her el in ineligible for a heart transplant. So if Ivana needed one, I'm pretty sure she would get one. So I don't think the delete. Like I understand. Like I know, um, I have a few friends whose kids have Down syndrome, and from I know for sure in the states. I'm not sure what it is in Canada that kids with Down syndrome aren't eligible for a heart transplant, which needs to change absolutely. Um, but from my understanding, kids with Dijorge syndrome um, are still eligible for a transplant. But like I explained, Ivana can't even have a heart transplant anyways, and not because of her Dijorge syndrome, but because of how um, intertwined her heart and her lungs are. Um, so all are all of Ivana's issues related to 22Q? Absolutely. So this is all like everything. The reason why Ivana, you know, got a heart defect. The reason why she has airway issues. Completely all 22Q related. Uh, 22Q or 22 deletion 11 Dijor syndrome. We often hear me refer to as 22Q. Um, it's a chromosomal defect that Ivana was born with. It means that she has a, um, a little piece missing, and she. It's what caused her heart defect. Not all 22Q kids are born with heart defects, um, and not are all born as severe as Ivana. Some kids will only be born. Some 22Q kids will only be born with a little hole in the heart. Um, some can. I know a common one is tetralogy. I pretty much all tetralogy I follow kids get. Um, get tested for Dijor syndrome I think like right off the bat so but it's definitely it's what caused Ivana's heart defect absolutely and it's definitely what caused the airway issues as well so basically everything that all of Ivana's problems all come back to just missing a tiny piece of chromosome but apparently it's a very important piece so I hopefully answered that question. Um, how is Ivana's T cell and B cell production in the immune system? Totally get why I asked this question because a lot of 22Q kids, um, there's a good chunk of 22Q kids who have immune issues. It's one of the main things associated with 22Q. From our understanding, Ivana's immune system is pretty a-okay. It's not where I, you know, it's not, we're not on isolation or anything. People don't have to gown up when they come into her room unless she has an infection. Um, we do, Ivana twice now has gone into acute liver failure and then her en liver enzymes have shot up like astronomically and then taken forever to come down. So we do, we are now suspecting that maybe her immune system slightly overshoots. Um, so we are going to get some tests run, but we have to wait till she's a little bit healthier to run those tests. So basically we just believe that Ivan, Ivana's immune system works, like she gets an infection, she her body does all the appropriate things in order to fight an infection but we think her body kind of overshoots and just kind of keeps going so instead of you know okay the infection is under control now she doesn't need to keep fighting it her body just kind of keeps going for a few extra days when it needs to stop so um there are and that's also i guess something that can be associated with 22q kids so once Ivana is a little bit healthy the um Immunology wants to run a test or two on Ivana and check out some of those liver enzymes and other things to see what her immune system is doing. So, um, so as far as her immune, sy immune system goes, we believe it's a-okay. Um, really, why Ivana keeps getting infections is for is because prolonged amount of time in hospital, all the lines that she always you know she either has she either had an IV in her. Um, pick line, central lines, arterial lines, like those, when you have a line in you, like the longer they're in, the more chance they are going to get an infection. So that's why she keeps getting infections. And then also trach, trach opens you up for a whole swack of, you know, it's an, it's an unnatural orifice. Um, every time we go to suction Ivana or disconnect her, you know, we're opening her up for a chance to getting bacteria and germs inside of it. So, of course, we're very careful, you know, we wash our hands, use hand sanitizer, put gloves on when we go to suction her. While in hospital, we use a brand new suction catheter every time. Um, we keep everything clean, but it's just germs are germs and they get everywhere. And, you know, 
our body, you know, orifices we have in our body, like our nose, our mouth, and everything else, you know, our body has built-in protections, but, you know, this is an unnatural place, and it, it just makes you more susceptible to infections. So that's why it seems like Ivana always keeps getting infections, and I don't think it's because of the 22Q, it's just because of all the other circumstances. So hopefully that answers some questions about the her 22Q. Um, I got a few questions about whether or not Ivana has or will need or will be getting a G-tube. Um, these are probably from other medical mamas and I totally understand why we are getting this question. Um, the reason why we haven't proceeded with a G-tube yet is for a few reasons. We kind of want Ivana to declare herself. Ivana, for the first five months, Ivana ate totally by mouth and we want to get to a position to get back there and we want, essentially we want Ivana to declare herself and that this is both not just myself um, saying this but also our medical team and in all reality I'm not against a G-tube like if everything we're dealing with a G-tube is actually the least of my worries we have so many other bigger things you know we've got Ivana's heart we've got her trach a G-tube would just everything we're dealing with would just be it would be something added to everything we're going through but it would actually be something very minor so I'm not against getting a G-tube for Ivana but we don't want to just give her one because it's technically another area for infection um, of possibly getting an infection but we just want to see what Ivana will do. So we are currently working on, I believe now that Ivana is doing A-OK, -okay, we are going to try and transition her back to NG feeding and then we're going to give her some food by mouth and then once she takes out a, an acceptable amount, we're going to do some swallow tests and then we're just going to see if she can eat by mouth because um, she was such a great eater prior to surgery and all of this so we want to see if we can get back there. We know it's not a guarantee, a trach changes things, I'm well aware of that, I'm not you know, naive or ignorant of that, you know, a trach does change things, but it doesn't hurt. It, we need to try. We need to try getting to see if she'll oral feed before we just go sticking in a G-tube. So that's why we haven't proceeded with a G-tube, but a G-tube isn't off the table either. Finally, the trach, trach questions. I got so many questions about the trach, and I totally, this is where all my frequently asked questions are usually related to is about her trach. Um, um, I know you've talked about her trach. Can you reiterate? Will she ever be able to go without the trach? How long do they anticipate her being on the home vent? Is there a chance um, she will be decannulated? This is taking the trach out. Um, I mean, it seems crazy, but will she always have the trach? Um, how are her lungs doing? Will she always have the trach? So, yeah. Um, whilst there are kids who do who are trached indefinitely, that is not the case for Ivana. Um, Ivana developed post-surgery tracheomalacia, so a weakened or softened trachea. All babies are technically born with a little bit soft, like the cartilage, your trachea is made of cartilage and it's all cartilage in babies are a bit softer and, but Ivana's trachea is just even a little bit extra soft and so, and I totally believe that's because of both 22Q, um, it's very common for 22Q kids to have, having troubles extubate and taking that, um, and needing just a little bit extra support, whether they have to wait a little bit longer to extubate, or whether they're extubate but they need to be have a little bit of extra oxygen on board for a few months. Um, not all kids need trachs after their surgery, um, and we tried everything to not have a trach forever, but eventually it was, after five and a half months of being intubated, it was our only option, so we finally did it. Um, for how, as far as how long, every kid is different, you know, there's the, our doctors, you know, like the ENTs and respirologists will give, you know, they, they give estimates, but that's all they are, they're estimates. Every kid is so different and it's just dependent on her and Ivana. Um, every day we're moving forward, it's a step-by-step -step process and eventually, we, you know, I'm very confident we will get her off the home vent and then once she's off the vent then she can definitely be decannulated. Um, there's some kids who are just have a trach and no ventilator. Um, usually those 
kids have upper airway issues, so maybe vocal cord paralysis or other structural issues, Ivana's airway issues are lower down, so she needs, she's tricked to be ventilated. Um, so once she gets stronger, I, absolutely she'll be decannulated. When we first went to trach Ivana, our ENT said, oh, I think she'll just need a trach for a year. And it's just because every time we do a bronchoscopy, her her trach, yeah, actually doesn't look that bad. Um, but we are now suspecting that she's got some bronchial malacia, so some malacia in her little bronchi, which you can't see. And then her weakened lungs. You know, she was, she was intubated for almost six months. When you're intubated, you know, it's a machine that does the breathing for you. So for five and a half months, Ivana had a machine breathe for her. So her lungs absolutely got weak. And so that's why she, her lungs are weak and it showed in her oxygen. You know, a few months ago, Ivana would need, needed about eight liters of oxygen. Um, and just a few weeks ago, she was on four liters, four and a half liters to be exact. And you know, recently we're gotten to about down to about two liters. The goal is to get her completely off, off the additional oxygen and just on pressurized air. And then when it comes to the pressurized air, this is why I'm thinking Ivana will need to have her trach for two to three years. Ivana's on a very high PEEP. She's on a um, PEEP is it's P E E P. Um, you might have to go look up the definition, but it, it basically stands for the amount of pressure being forced into Ivana to keep the trachea open. Um, a normal person, like if you have a surgery, uh, once you get down to about a PEEP of five, they will extubate you after. Um, Ivana on the home ventilator is on a PEEP of 12. Usually if she's on the servo eye, like on the hospital ventilator, she only needs about a PEEP of 10. But as you can see, Ivana requires a lot of PEEP. And that's kind of why I'm thinking it'll be two to three years, in my opinion, of how long it's going to take to decannulate Ivana. Decannulation is the process of removing the trach. Um, and so that's as far as how long Ivana will need it. It's up to her, you know, we all say two to three year, years. Tracheomalacia actually, it's funny, it's one of those conditions that actually gets worse before it gets better and they say it usually gets worse around 12 to 16 months. Ivana is 16 months old, so hopefully here on moving forward, um, Ivana will start to get stronger. Um, that's why it's so important that we start to do all these physio. I feel like the more we push Ivana and the more we get her sitting up and not lying down will be better for her lungs and the more she starts to get mobile and I can't wait to see Yes, you know, even despite she, despite the trach and the vent, you know, she's gonna crawl and she's gonna learn to walk and with that vent and everything. Um, you know, we've had some nurses say like it's amazing what these kids with trachs and vents do and how they kind of just rise above it and don't let they don't let it stop them. So I really feel that once um, I really feel like Ivana's starting to do so well and take off and. We're just going to see her just excel over the next several months. So our first goal is to get her off oxygen. One of our biggest hurdles to, that's keeping us in hospital is the fact that Ivana has a cuffed trach. So Ivana currently has a 3.5 cuffed trach. 3.5 um, is in reference to the size of trach she has, but she also has a cuff. A cuff is kind of like a little balloon around the outside of the trach, and it kind of acts as a seal. And what we're planning on doing, they really don't like kids going home with a cuff trach here in Canada. It, there's there's just some extra risks associated, especially if it were to accidentally rip out. That would be so, 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 so bad. So they really like to, it's just, they would rather not send kids home with a cuff trach. So in a few weeks, we're actually headed back down to the ICU just for a sleepover where they want to change out her 3.5 cuffed trach for a 4.0 uncuffed trach. And so, you know, like right now Ivana's on a peep of 12 on the home ventilator. I think she could probably go down to 10 right now in my personal opinion. But because we're going to be moving, because we're going to be transitioning her to a different trach, we're just going to leave her peep alone and just worry about it after. Because with, with an uncuffed trach, there's going to be some peep or some air escaping. So it's okay that she's still on the high peep. And... Another question I got is, what is it like having a trach child? What kind of care is involved and will she ever not need it? It's tough having a trach child, I will admit. it's There's a reason why 
you know, Nick and I fought it, you know. Ivana's surgery was last October, and then it was around November that they started saying the word trig. They weren't saying, okay, she needs a trig, but they started bringing up that word. And it wasn't until this past, you know, it took us five months to kind of finally say, okay. And we tried everything. Our cardiac surgeon didn't even want Ivana trig because she's got so much issues going on cardiac, and he just didn't want the trig complicated thing and complicating things because it does. And we tried everything we could to not trach Ivana. So that's kind of, you know, it's it's hard. It's There's a lot of reasons why we said no. It opens her up for more infections. It's, I, I now have a tube attached to my child. Like, it's just, you, you don't know how lucky you are to have a cordless child. Like, you just, can pick up your baby and walking around in the house. Whereas Ivana will always have this machine, not always, but while she's tricked and vented, she has this machine attached to her. And there's so much involved, like, you know, I think the biggest reason why I was so not wanting it is our home, you know, once we bring Ivana home, we will need home care. And that's, all of a sudden we open up ourselves, you know, our home is not private anymore. You know, you have that, you have that, everyone has that luxury of having the privacy of their own home. We don't have that anymore. We'll have nurses in our home every night, you know, caring for Ivana so we can sleep. But, you know, like, we were talking with the home care coordinator and, you know, like, we just can't have a, like, if Nick and I have a disagreement, we can't really, like, fight in front of the nurses or, you know, she was, like, joking around, we can't, like, walk around in our underwear now in our home, not that we do, do but you know what I mean? Like, you just, you lose that sense of privacy. And I'll admit I'm still bitter towards the whole thing, you know, we brought in a child with major, major cardiac issues, you know, when it comes to heart defects, we, I always say we got dealt a Goliath of a heart defect, and now we're bringing home with still cardiac issues and now critical airway issues, and I just, it's, I know life isn't fair, but boy, <laughs> has this not been fair, you know, like I just, you know, we got dealt two big things and it's just like, when will, when will all the complications stop? And I know that like the trach and the vent is a temporary situation. It's something that we'll eventually be able to get away from, but you know, in the, where like the, unlike the cardiac, the cardiac will always be an issue. So, you know, I don't, you know, while I don't hate the trach, I still don't like it. And I still, you know, I, I get asked the question, do we wish we would, a lot of families might say, oh, I wish I would have trached my child earlier. Sometimes Nick and I wish we would have done it earlier, but at the same time, we, we wanted, I would have regretted if we didn't try everything we could to not trach Ivana. So that's kind of my thoughts and feelings on the trach. Um, you know, I, I don't hate it, but I don't love it. And it is what it is. And it's what's going to get us home. So I guess that's, at the end of the day, that's what's important. Having Ivana traked in on a home ventilator is what's going to get her out of the hospital and home, in our, back into our home. So, there you go. Alright, that is all for today. I answered about half the questions. Um, I was hoping to do this all in one video, but then when I realized how many questions I got and then how long I was taking to answer them, that this was going to be too long of a video. So... Hopefully you don't mind that I just put this into two videos. So I answered a bulk of the questions. I still got quite a few left to go. Um, I le most importantly answered the trach questions, which is I know pretty the most frequently asked question is always about Ivana's trach. So I answered those questions and stay tuned for the next video where I answer the other questions. And thank you so much for the support, the love, the prayers. It means the world to myself and my husband. He may be a little less on the social media bandwagon, but we still, the support has been so outstanding and we're so grateful and we know prayers are heard and I'll probably get into that a little bit later. And I just appreciate every one of you for praying for her and thinking of her and of Ivana and she, and we just, I can't thank you guys enough. So that's all for today and stay tuned for this frequently asked question video series.